you see me? Right, we're live. Hi, good evening. Welcome. This is Roy Lilly. John's on the camera tonight. The blonde isn't here, so I'm having to be hunt I'm like the hunchback of Notre Dame doing this. Right? Is that about right, John? Can you see all of me? Uh, sadly, yes. <laughs> can, can I stand up? Right, okay. Listen, welcome uh, to the King's Fund. It's a lovely sunny evening here, cold but great evening. And we've got a great evening uh, ahead of us as well. The future of uh, general practice, primary care, family practice, and the future of the NHS is all rolled into one, isn't it? And so tonight we've got um, a superb guest to come and talk us that through with, that, with us, and it's the the boss of the Royal College of General Practitioners. Who would have thought it? With a name like Lampard. I thought you'd be playing football, but anyway, it's lovely to see you. Come and join me. Thank you so much. Big warm welcome. Thanks Thank you so much. much. Come, and sit down. Come and have a seat. Big round of applause from this enormous audience. <laughs> Alan Stokes Lampard. Now, what I, how do you get a Stokes and a Lampard? How does that work? Well, you start by being married, uh, born a Stokes. Yes. Stokes, yeah. and then you get married to a Lampard, yeah. and you qualify as Dr. Stokes and live a while as Mrs. Lampard, and it gets really confusing yeah. and a bit tedious, and in the end I just thought I'm going to run the two together. Really? We, my mother-in-law suggested I became Stokes de Lampard, because apparently Lampards were de Lampard a few generations ago. No, I thought you father read that family. I thought we were going to talk football all night, <laughs> but there you are. No, no, I prefer the, the other yeah. game. So you're a Welsh girl from Welsh girl. Swansea. Yes, yes. marvellous. Okay, did you always, uh, did, are you one of these little girls that bandaged up her teddy and always wanted to be a... No, actually, I, I, when I, so I grew up in a family with no medics in the family at all, my parents were teachers, um, but came from a very working class background, um, and when I was growing up I was interested in people, I was interested in science, and there is one photo of me which bandaged my brother up, but that was about it, and that was possibly more to do with sibling rivalry than anything else. Yeah. Um, but actually, as I was growing up, it was a kind of, I thought about medicine, I thought seriously about dentistry, um, I thought about engineering. Well, what put those thoughts into your mind? Well, I think it's role models, I think it's people you meet. So uh, my dad taught science, and um, I saw people struggle with A-levels. And I remember when I was about 10 years old, somebody said, well, what would you like to do when you grow up? I said, well, perhaps I'd like to be a doctor. And when Never thought about being a teacher? No, although naturally, I mean, I love to teach, and so, but no, <coughs> it was more, always more the science things, but I yeah. think... Uh, when I said that, somebody said, oh, it's very difficult to be a doctor, you know, not, not, not many people get through training. And I kind of just assumed that I wasn't bright enough to do it, and so I put it over my head. Um, but a dear family friend was a dentist, <coughs> and I was very impressed with her. She was really sort of grounded and fun and inspiring, and she was doing great things. And I, as a teenager, I went and stayed with her for a little holiday. And I thought, I've got to be a dentist, it's great, you know, great fun. Um, and then when I did my O-levels, because I'm of the generation who did O-levels, um, I got quite good results and I went off to a sixth form college and people said, oh, so you're going to do medicine? And I said, well, I haven't really thought about it. And she said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, time bit of engineering, possibly uh, dentistry. Well, engineering was a big choice as well, wasn't it? We don't get, we don't get many engineers. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of, you know, my dad always treated me as a person, not as a girl or a boy. Mm. And I had a lot of role models as I was growing up who were Gender wasn't a big deal, and I don't know whether it was just about coming from a quite working class background where everyone just pitched in and did whatever needed to be done. And I've always been quite practical, always happy to have a go. So, you know, whether it was digging the garden with Dad or fixing something, uh, you know. I, so I've always been fairly practical, and I think my dad's like, you know, the world needs more engineers, it's great to have an engineer. And my mum was going, oh, what am I going to do that? With visions of Greece and so on. And, um, and so it was genuinely when I started my A-levels when people started saying, you know, medicine's an amazing place to go. And I started doing some serious homework, thought about things that had happened. You know, parents have health problems, grandparents have health problems. And I actually thought, you know what, there is some really interesting stuff there. And I started getting interested in gynaecology, women's health problems. And I thought, actually, I could do that because my mum had had some issues. And um, yeah, there's something there. There's a lovely balance of medicine and surgery. Um, we had great family doctors growing up. and so. Um, I applied for and went to medical school, although I did mess up my A-levels first time around. I messed up one of my A-levels, which was an interesting learning experience. Um, went off to St. George's, where I had the most amazing time. Why St. George's? Why not a Welsh uh, hospital? Because <laughs> I was a teenager in the 1980s and we all wanted to get away. The world was our oyster. Um, and yes, the family would have loved me to go to Cardiff, and Cardiff is a wonderful medical school. I certainly went for a look around to keep everyone happy, but I never wanted to. It was too close to home, mm. even though once you go to university, you can be five miles from home and you're a million miles in reality, aren't you? 
Um, so I just wanted to move further away. Um, and I think there was something like a draw of London to, you know, to so take the working class So you did your rotations background. around South London? No, I didn't actually, because um, when I was in uh, medical school, I met and married my husband, an engineer, um, and, and he got a job in South Wales. His first proper job was in, back in South Wales, ironically. And so I ended up, I did my first house job in London, and then I got went back to South Wales and did my second house job in South Wales. Was that easy to do? Because well, it wasn't a devolved responsibility then, was it? Um, it wasn't easy to do. It took a lot of begging and pleading, but really yeah. sensible people uh, who sorted out the placements in those days. Now, we didn't have a central clearing system that was locally done. Um, and really sensible, wise people who could see that if your heart and your head are in a different part of the country, you will work better if you're in a different part of the country. And um, I mean, they did try to persuade me to stay, but what they did is they arranged a swap. They contacted Cardiff and said, we've got um, a young doctor who wants to do a medical house job in South Wales. Would you like a medical house job in South London? Um, we'll swap you. And we did. So they were non-medical uh, uh, school jobs. So they were not the professorial jobs, they were regarded as very much service jobs. It was an amazing experience. I went to a busy, small BGA. Um, of course, met a whole bunch of new doctors and people are still friends now. You know, but so. the training was different then, whether you did, you still had, you were still attached to a firm. Yeah, firm based, firm -based teaching, so yeah. small firms, very small firms. I was in a huge firm when I did my surgical job. Do you think we've lost anything by that disappearing now? The rotations are three months and you've never been at one place long enough. I mean, the, the richness of that, the importance of that team, that firm, I think is incredibly important. I mean, okay, so I was back there in the bad old days of silly hours and, you know, doing, starting work on a Saturday morning and finishing on Monday night, you know, you're mm. incapable of coherent conversation, you know, <coughs> let alone writing a drug chart or doing something important like looking after a patient. Um, but actually what you had was a team, you had an incredible camaraderie, there was always somebody to go to. Um, and I, I think we really did throw out the baby with the bathwater and we moved forward and made progress with a working plan for the rest of an hours. But as a consequence, lost that team structure and that firm. You know, every nurse Well, we missed the opportunity, didn't we? Because we went to Europe and said we can't do it. We had a derogation for, was it five or seven years, I think, yeah. to sort ourselves out. Yeah. We just squandered that time. And then yeah. suddenly we were hit with the working time directive. And we had to change everything within 18 months. Um, and I, you know, I do believe that the working time directive ultimately is a good thing and a right thing. I think safe doctors are much better doctors, but we could yeah. do it better in terms of working as teams. Well, it's interesting. I mean, if, you're a, if you are a lorry driver, mm -hmm. you can only drive for nine hours. Mm -hmm. If you're a, an airline pilot, <laughs> you can only uh, fly for 2,000 hours a year. But if you're a, a nurse, mm -hmm you can do three back-to-back 12-hour -back days and then go and do a couple of moonlights in a care home. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're a doctor, well, you'll have to do the rotations and then you, if you're in a position to do it, you might well go and do a, a, a yeah. locum, yeah. you know, out yeah. of hours. Uh, and is it safe? I mean, I don't think it is, is it? It's probably not. I think the difficulty with safety is that it's really hard to quantify. It's really hard to put fixed boundaries on it. And obviously, I'm very interested in safety in terms of how GPs work and how their whole team work. And if you can't say X number of minutes or hours or X number of consultations are safe because of that complexity and the intensity yeah, of the Yeah, but you know problems. when people are knackered. You do, absolutely, you know when people are knackered. And you can trust professionals to say, actually, I'm really not safe. You know, yeah. I did, so yesterday in my practice, I was a duty doctor. I was in the surgery for 13 hours yesterday, and I didn't stop. It was full on and it was frantic. As it happened, there were no desperately sick patients that needed my attention. As it happened, although I saw a huge number of patients, I didn't see too many very high challenge patients. So I got to the end of the day and I wasn't panicking that I'd made a mistake. But actually at the end of a day like that, and it's only that bad because we've got a doctor off stage, we've tried to difficulty recruiting, the sort of things that GPs would say in the country over, you are, you are really worried, thinking, oh gosh, have I forgotten anything? Have I missed anything? You know, okay, so I'm an experienced GP and I'm used to safety netting and I keep my lists and I've got my systems and I stick to them and I don't leave the building till I've double-checked my own systems to make sure I haven't forgotten anything. But we're all terrified in that, in that onslaught. So it's not right and it's probably not safe. And we all worry that we're one step away from making a serious mistake mm. because of the pressure of the system. And that's why I'm doing what or, I'm doing. Or you miss something. Like, yeah. Uh, in the paper today, all the GPs are missing all these cancer diagnoses. 
to the saint. God only is there to diagnose them for us. Well, it's a relief, isn't it? Yeah, it's no, best I... to go to A and E first. Why mess about with the middleman? Uh, yeah, but you don't do so well if you go to A and E first. Or if you present to A and E, the odds are you'll do worse. Now that was a spectacularly unhelpful headline today from actually a really quite well, good piece of research. Would you unpack that for us? Because it's sure. not what it seems. Of course, it's not what it seems. So, really good study published in the British Journal of General Practice today. Um, looking at the whole patient pathways for cancer and all cancers, not just some of the big ticket cancers that have been investigated. Well, that's the problem, is it? Because if you take, if we say cancer and yeah. you look at the outcomes, well, actually, to be honest, some of the comparisons aren't that great. But if we compare against the European data, Eurostat, it's collected on a different basis. Some Indeed. of it isn't collected at all. The deaths yeah. are typically aren't available. I mean, yeah. even in Europe, they don't collect stuff. And you know. You to look at some of the recently accession current uh, countries. You know, I, are we really to believe that the cancer outcomes are better there? No, <coughs> they do the data differently. Absolutely, they do. Yeah, and you know, we have phenomenal data in the UK and probably some of the best health data in the world it is. because we yeah. measure it consistently because we have a universal. Well, we've had it since system. 1948. Yeah. Absolutely, and you know we've got computerised GP records back to the 80s. You know you've got all the prescribing data from the 1980s. So we have phenomenal data, and the problem is we're unfairly compared with people who only collect data on people who are privately insured or people who are only in the state system and that's the other bit. So, however, there are a few things we can say. We can say that for what we spend per capita on health, we do brilliantly, but we are not as good as the best of the best in certain areas of care. So. There are certainly things we can learn and do better, and with better investment and more people, we could do better in some areas. Bowel cancer, we don't do very good. Yeah, it's somehow difficult again. Lifestyle well, is an issue. Well, you know why, isn't it? It's, it for, you've got to go spooning around the cars, for a sample. Who wants to do that? There, there must be a better test. There is. Although I do have a very sneaky, keeping your hands clean way of collecting a sample. No, which I don't I tell you about again. That's, this is perhaps something we might just skip over. <laughs> Usually, I'd like to have a penetrating, insightful. <laughs> But uh, we'll, leave, <laughs> we'll leave the spooning in the car seat uh, to another time. But, okay, after the but there are, but there are. I know that there are better tests, but there they're are. more expensive. They're more expensive, and you know you've got. And, to and not only that, you've got to have t you've got to have spoon in the car seat on, on two separate days. You've got to spoon in the car seat, put it in a box, bung it in the fridge, and hope no one confuses it with anything else. Coming in late one night after a curry, who knows? And then the next day you've got to do it again. It sounds like a positive experience, right? Yes. <laughs> Move on. You're obviously traumatised there. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we do talk about society. You know, even the Romans recognised the mark of a civilised society is the distance you put between yourself and your excrement. And so, you know, people are fundamentally hardwired to not play with, with their excrement, you know. So, but I think that's completely reasonable. It's the same with lots of things we do in health. But actually, some things are good for us, and we have to have a better conversation yeah, that's about That's why doing people it. won't do it. So, okay, so you were down, let me think, yeah, so where were you? You were down in uh, somewhere in the darkest, deepest wilds. You finished mm. your training, and then... So I so started it, training some, in Ops and Gallagher. Something peculiar happened, didn't it? Because you went off and did a research job. You say, it's more like you, 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 you qualified in medicine, but you've also got a PhD. I have got PhD. Yeah, what's your PhD in? So it's oh, primary care epidemiology. Yeah. Numbers and data, and but it's about gynecological cancer screening. Yeah. So that in in summary, I am the world expert in a test that we don't do in general practice anymore. Right. So you know, it's really helpful to be an ex expert in Visma, bulk smears, which were the tests that we used to do on women who didn't have a cervix anymore. So the smear test, you know, everyone's familiar with cervical screening. When women had had a hysterectomy, uh, until about seven or eight years ago. GPs often would do a couple of what were called vault smears. That was taking a similar sample from the scar that was left internally when the womb and the cervix were gone. Um, the problem is it's a really unreliable test because it was never designed to work that way. Um, and it took uh, so, some years of research to basically prove it was a rubbish test and we shouldn't be doing it anymore. And I published my PhD and actually persuaded the screening program to take it out just like that, suddenly. You know, years of work, you build up to it. It was almost a non-event, just gone overnight. So it needed someone to publish. Yeah. Interesting. So it's, it's really, it is interesting. And yeah. It's hard it's, to get published, isn't it? It is hard to get published. Yeah. So, but, you know, I didn't, but, but actually, it was the conversation I had with the screening people that really mattered. It was that individual interaction. Yeah. But I mean, for a relatively young doctor, as you were at the time, I'm not saying you weren't well qualified, <laughs> but I mean, you know, to produce a paper and change the face of national screening um, saved a lot of money. Well, I was, I was no, I'm, I'm just interested in the whole topic of, of, of clinicians, yeah. doctors and 
young doc younger doctors mainly and, mm. and younger nurses mm. being able to get published. The, the whole thing seems to be loaded against them. So I was lucky in the way it landed, okay? So lots of serendipity in my career and the way life has gone. So I started, I did start gynaecology, so I trained in Obst and Gynae in South Wales for several years. Had some life events, decided to change direction, ended up in the Midlands. Looking Birmingham. In, in Birmingham, so Birmingham. Yeah. Birmingham Women's Hospital. Oh, actually Birmingham Medical School. Birmingham University. Right. So no, I never. Did, did you not go to Birmingham? So I used. I did my research. I ultimately, because of my background in gynae, when I I got a job as an academic GP trainee. So I, I applied for and got a job as a trainee where I did half GP training and half academic training. I see. Because so it's a really wacky career wacky, path. It is wacky. Hmm. It is wacky, and it was total serendipity. I phoned up the West Midlands Deanery. I wanted to do public health. That was the, the idea. You can't save the individual, save society. Save the Go world. To public health. Well, clearly. Yeah. Go to public health, had a lovely chat with the people in public health, and they said, oh, your CV's great, but you do need some experience in general practice. Here's the number of the people who can give you a job in general practice. Phoned up, and they said, oh, you've just missed the training round, but we've got these academic jobs, and if you want to do public health, an academic background would be great. Um, and in fact, the phone was answered in West Midlands Deanery by a chap called Steve Field. Oh, yes, I remember him. Yeah. Didn't he used to be a GP? Yeah, yeah. certainly was. Well, still yeah. is a GP. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't, he, didn't he mess up the Lansley reforms? Steve Field. Almost single handedly. Steve is a great man and a great GP. <laughs> Hi, Steve. I know you watch. Yeah. Uh, so, he, um, so he answered the phone and he said, Great job. Why don't you apply? Get your CV to me by five o'clock. And uh, this is, you know, this is pre email days. This is running to HR for a copy of my CV. Saying, Please, could you get a copy of my CV? Because I was in work as a junior doctor. Grabbing it, annotating it, faxing it off. And the next thing, being interviewed for and getting this job as an academic. Um, and this sounded terribly grand, and I had no idea what it really meant. But it was a chance to learn to be, learn to teach, learn to do research, and train to be a GP, which is a fantastic That's opportunity. a unique opportunity. Isn't it? Well, it's not unique. We've got schemes across the <coughs> country. You can do academic GP training. That's relatively unique, yeah. 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 It's uncommon because academics... Yeah. I thought you were involved with the Birmingham Women's Hospital. Well, my research, so, so the University of Birmingham is on the same site as Queen Elizabeth Hospital and Birmingham Women's Hospital. Because they've all had a big reshop out there, They've they? always reshopped in Birmingham. Yeah. So, while I was a medical student... Two Deaths Jane is running both places now. Wow. Well, yeah. There's all sorts of stuff. Do you think there should be a women's hospital? There's no men's hospital, is there? What's so important about women? Well, who's a historian? <laughs> <laughs> well, where to begin? How long have you got, Roy? <laughs> Just looking around the audience, I think I'm on safe territory tonight. Uh, rarely. Don't count. I was going to say. Unusually. Well, you don't, do you? You don't get a men's hospital. These things are historical because they came out of maternity units and maternity hospitals and the increasing so specialisation of It's all, it's all of about dining. plumbing. It's a little ladies, more sophisticated ladies than that. Ladies plumbing. Interestingly, women's hospitals don't just do women's work because they do infertility care, which is male and female orientated. So it's not just. They also do genetics work, which again, male and female. Um, but this women's th this whole mm. women's thing interests me because you 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 were specialist in women's health mm. and and in I'm some a GP. yeah well in some parts mm. of the world women's health is just about uh, fertility family planning mm. and all that kind of stuff but actually you know if you look at the role of women globally they bear the burden of poverty they yeah. bear the burden of family <coughs> family and family distress uh, they bear the burden of uh, or education or, or non-education. I mean, there's a lot of public health issues mm. that mitigate against yeah. uh, the health of women. But women still stubbornly live longer than men. It's remarkable. It's really it's irritating. Well, I tell you why. It's because men lead blameless lives and are taken unto our Lord early. Do you think so? Yes. That's Isn't that right, guys? Fascinating hypothesis, Roy. Right? <laughs> yes. I, I may get my next PhD. <laughs> at that. What do you think? Well, let me know. I'd be interested to <laughs> review the. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, you know, we talk now about women's issues, and you're right, it's far bigger than just gynaecology, you know, mental health. So in the UK, you know, we're a devel developed world, we're not, we have equality laws, we're not talking about women um, who aren't educated and women who haven't got access to contraception, and, you know, we are a different world here, but in other parts of the world, it's very basic, and you're absolutely right. In the UK, women's health, of course, it's much greater, <coughs> perinatal and postnatal mental health is a serious issue, and has consequences but that has consequences for the whole family um, and you're right women of course th tend to be the ones who use more resource in terms of health care when they're younger because they're bringing children to health care services and by being well pregnant. if you look at the whole health care system we, we employ more women than men yep we we care for more what well, the, the time spent on on 
men and women. We spend more time on women for the reasons that you've just said. We spend quite a bit on men. Don't yeah, we? no, no, but we spend more time. Yeah. Uh, and also, uh, women are most likely to be carers. Yes. Uh, uh, but probably the NHS is the most unfriendly women employer uh, in the world, I would think. You know, you get, you get hospitals cool. employing 8,000 nurses and not a creche to be seen. Well, and I mean, I think that sort of stuff is, is crazy because we have got the scale inside to be doing it and doing it so much better. When you compare us to family-friendly employers and to great employers, it, there is a, certainly a lot more that can be done. But we're not the worst place to employ women, absolutely not. You know, there are... Well, not in GP land, because half of GPs are women, aren't they? I think it's probably even more than that. It's certainly, go, certainly going into it, it's more significantly more now, so yeah. Uh, which is, but that's great. We, we choose I've given the best. up with my GP. We my my, my GP is retired and he's been replaced. He he's been re he's been replaced by a young lady and I just couldn't go. Couldn't, couldn't you? No. You might be pleasantly surprised. No, she's I marvellous. No, I could. Well, she's probably, but I can't. You know, it's not. I don't know. You know, it's geezers, isn't it? You know, no, I want to see another geezer. See, that's why I want men's help. Uh, but you see, uh, well, there are experts. There are plenty of GPs who are experts in men's health. It's well. all women but now. You see, right? When you go and see a GP. The GP will adapt their style to you. Now, I have patients just like you. No, you don't. <laughs> well, I have patients who appear to be quite similar to you. And I just said that I... If it, Last it, time I saw my GP, he was in Albufeira in a restaurant. He was very surprised to see me because he was there with a practice manager. Great. <laughs> I'm sure they're having a business meeting. Absolutely. I, it, it makes it easy for me to get an appointment. Now. No, no, he's retired now. And it's, the place is run by women. Gosh, does it run beautifully? Uh, well, I, I won't go because there's no geezer service. Well, then you can register with a practice that has a geezer service. Well, it's not that easy because it's, it's all women. Easy. You see, what, time, what about all the old geezers? What was going to happen to men's then health? Then you should give it a try and come and chat and see a <laughs> female GP because they're marvellous. And seriously, people do adapt their I've got maggots in my scrotum. I mean, how, how, you? Can you, how can you say that? I think that's a very interesting system. Would you like to expand on that, Ron? <laughs> You've not seen the Book of Mormon show, have you? I haven't, no. No, it's a great show. If you don't watch it, you watch it this own. <laughs> You've got to go and see the Book of Mormon. It's, a, it's in the West End. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've seen it advertised. And it's the, Jehovah's, it's the story yeah. of Jehovah's Witnesses going in, and they go to Africa, right? And uh, they, they, they all think they're going to get a job in, in Las Vegas, but these two guys who are very uh, youthful go to, they get sent to some African place, that, which is like horrendous. And when they arrive, they say, right, we're here to help you, and God will help you. And uh, so somebody comes and says, you know, my crops have failed. He said, well, pray for your crops. And then somebody else comes and might fail. And then this guy comes in, he says, I've got maggots in my scrotum, you see. And the audience, like, break up. And these, these guys who were very young, obviously, they don't know what to say. You know, and they said, uh, uh, have you seen a doctor? And he said, I am the doctor. <laughs> I've just given away the best gag in the Book of Mormon. Okay. But you must come and see it. I don't know how we got onto that. I've, had, onto I've that? had some great things that patients have said to me, but often through language difficulties. So, anyway, we digress. Right, uh, we were yes, yes. So yes, men are very ill served by oh, uh, yeah. by the NHS. Anyway, so so you you you've been something. In your of, humble opinion. You've been a something. It's correct. Um, you've been something of a dilettante in GP land. Mm. Work one day a week as a GP mm. and ended up the most influential GP in Britain. How the hell did that happen? I wonder that myself sometimes, Roy. I do wonder that myself. <laughs> Where did you get elected? It's outrageous. I mean, there are proper GPs working 13 hours yeah, a day. exactly like me yesterday. Yeah, you're floating about, <laughs> palavering about writing papers. So I did the academic thing, which was 50-50 academic and general practice. So I trained in the city of Birmingham in the practice, got a really good <coughs> grounding in the realities of life but then did the academic thing um, and decided that actually I wanted to do a bit more with it. I was interested in the gynae thing. It took years to do the various bits of research to come together to get to that PhD. But also I was sponsored and funded by the National Institute of Health Research, the NIHR. So they offer scholarships to people to pay for them, to, to have the time to devote to research. Because you're right, it is hard to get into the research role. You need to dedicate a lot of time to do it, to do it well. Because in this day and age, bad research isn't worth doing. You need to do by all means, do a bit of pilot stuff, get an idea, but make sure if you're going to really invest time that you're doing your proper research, yes. you can then publish. Well, I because think, if you can't publish it... But don't you think, I mean, there's a lot of people out there who are, who are doing really good things. Yes. And, and they don't publish their papers like you did. Uh, I think you're a great example of someone who, who really against all odds at a time when, you know, when the world was very different then. Yeah. You know, 
that you're a woman, yeah. uh, you know, it was different for women then, you published, you were young, you got published. It's very hard to get published. It is, but actually, well, being, having scholars, so, so there's a difference between doing the full academic thing, mm. which isn't for everybody, but there is space, and if you're really keen, there are opportunities and ways to do it. But then there's scholarship, there's accepting that we need to find out more, that doing things well and having a scientific or academic base is something that all of us in healthcare can get involved in. So getting involved in research doesn't necessarily mean being the principal investigator and leading it and publishing in your own name, but it can be having a good idea, talking to research departments in your hospitals or in your community, in your CCG or in your locality, and helping <coughs> that research, and letting other people perhaps run it, but then being a part of it, contributing. So in general practices, doing research, Patients love being part of research, and we haven't got enough real-world research, real grounded research about patients who are complicated. I don't think we have enough route to market with the results, because you know you get the big mm. institutions like the Lancet and mm. the BMJ, and you know they're very good and very academic, and I'm mm. not being critical, but they don't make it easy. They don't, but it's. It is widening the path, so there are a lot of open access places where you can publish more easily. You've got to pay for it, but you can publish. So if you've had funding to do the research in the first place, now you factor in the cost of publishing as well. So it's, that is easier. The internet has helped. Do you think it should be free? Publishing? Mm. I think that all good quality research should be available to everybody. So yes, I do think it should be free, but ultimately yeah. everything has a cost. So nothing is truly free. Somebody's paying somewhere, somewhere. so we've got to be pragmatic <coughs> about it. Well, I don't want to get sidetracked by that, but anyway, but it, uh, it just it's a subject that it's yeah. interesting. Well, I'd it's like, a moral imperative. I'd like to try and do something about it myself. Yeah. Anyway, so there you go. You've, you've done it. Uh, what, what, what you were, you were the treasurer for the Royal College of... So, well... Yeah, of, do you, how, did, how did, I suppose, you, you have to join the, the Royal the College, don't you? Really? So, uh, nowadays, everybody who becomes a GP in the country has to do our membership examination. You don't yeah. have to stay a member, but you have to do the exam to be a licensed Why? practitioner. Sorry? Why? Why? What, do, why don't you have well, to Well, if you're qualified, yes. then you know, what's you got to do with the Royal College? It's poking their nose in. I mean, if, you, if you're qualified, you're qualified. Scientific knowledge applied with compassion, right? Lifelong learning, comradeship, support. No. Really? No. Don't you have anything you believe in? No, I don't believe the Royal Colleges. I'd close you? them down. Yeah. Would you? Yeah. Well, you could close them down, but you know, there, something else would fill the gap. There is a need. People wouldn't stay members. It's not our, It's not mandatory to stay. We have a great time. It's a nice Life place, though, the Royal Colleges. If you know, if you come to London, 60 Euston Square, 30. pop uh, 30, 30 Euston, no, 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 don't go to 60, <laughs> go to 30, sorry, that's where I've been going, 60 is very nice, right. yes. 60 is great, 60 something else, yeah, yeah. 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 you can rent a bedroom by the hour, yeah. uh, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm in the wrong choose. place, no, 30, 30 Euston Square is, uh, go to the coffee shop, it's fantastic, it's free Wi-Fi, lovely coffee, yeah, get someone to show you around, it's yeah. a great place for a coffee, no, it's a fab, and it's amazing headquarters, and it was a big exciting thing, which overlapped when well, I it was a bit, so you were there when the decision was made because you ripped the place apart. We did. So I took. I How did all that happen? So I was elected as treasurer when the decision had been made and the building had been bought and the builders were already in. So How I did you get no elected credit. treasurer? Is treasurer one of the jobs that nobody wants to do? Yeah, probably. Yeah. I, I ended up in my local faculty as a, I ended up as a trainee rep for the college when I was young because I was noisy and interested and wanted to make a difference. Then I started with my academic career, did the local faculty thing for the regional college in the Midlands. Um, and somebody asked me to be treasurer because I was doing an epidemiology PhD, so clearly numbers didn't scare me. I, I liked a spreadsheet. I love a good spreadsheet. So, but as I always say, with treasurer stuff and money, I learned to add up and take away by the time I was five. Money's not difficult. It's adding up and taking away. It's people that are difficult, the people that are interesting. So I ended up as treasurer locally, and then after doing that for seven years, the big job came up, and Steve Field again said, you should go for that. Mm -hmm. In fact, he said to, to a room full of people, Help me encourage her to go for it. So I Steve did. Phil's got a lot to answer. He's got a lot to answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to okay. Right, uh, and then, then, then you had a big drama there, didn't you? Because you dramas. fell out with a builder. Well, doesn't everybody? Well, yeah, I suppose you do. Really. Most of us have fallen out with a builder some stage or other. But it's not like building a conservatory, is it's it? It's not like building a conservatory. It was a huge project, a huge initiative. And uh, despite having our differences with our builders, I'm very pleased. One of my crowning glories as treasurer was we brought the project in on budget, mm. under budget. Yeah, um, who was the architect, the great architect? Oh, Cathy Tilney is, was the architect. Of, it was Tilney Shane Associates at the time, although she's sub, they've, they've been taken over, I think she's retired. But Cathy <coughs> Tilney was wonderful, so she had a great vision for a, a fascinating grade two listed building that was some really complex and difficult things to work with. Mm. If you've not been there, it's full of Victorian tiling, which is brown and cream in places, green and cream in others, 
damaged tiling that because it's grade two star listed you can't fix or do anything with. So you have to work with a really complicated place, but to turn it into something modern and dynamic, which talks, which speaks about general practice, obviously reflecting the past mm. but looking to the future. Well, you've got that uh, permanent exhibition of old implements, yeah, and stuff, and bits and pieces. Yeah. Actually, very good. Uh, did she do the inside of the row of the? Um, of the RCN as well. It's a very similar it's architectural style. She style. didn't, no, I don't think right. she did. I don't think so. I don't think she did. No, but yeah. it is similar in those. Uh, but it, it, yeah, it's a, it's a lovely building, and if ever you're in London, do go to 30 Euston Square, not 60, and, and, and have a look. So, okay, and didn't you fall out with somebody? I remember reading that you fell out with another big. Oh, I don't fall out with somebody. No, you had, a, you, you had a court case or something. I can't remember who it was now. Who you're was talking it? about the college exam. That, oh, that. that's right, the exam where mm -hmm. you upset all the Asian doctors by wow. discriminating against them. It was outrageous. How did you get, what on earth did you do that for? <laughs> so our college was the first college to publish details about pass rates um, for people from all ethnic backgrounds and whether you were part-time or gender. So we published all this data about our exam. Um, and what it showed was that there was a differential attainment for people who had come from overseas. So anybody who trained overseas had a lower pass rate of our exam than if you trained in the UK, irrespective of which part of the world you came from. Um, if you were female, you had a higher chance of passing compared to male, irrespective of really? whatever you did. Yeah, absolutely. However, these results are, are mirrored in all professional exams all around the world in all sorts of professions. This isn't just medicine, but we just happened to be the first to publish it. So did you discover we why? Yeah, well, it's very complicated why. I mean, there are some things that we know, and it's not that the exam is unfair. The most important thing, and judicial review confirmed that the exam is not prejudiced against anybody. you were taken all the way. We were taken all the way, and we were clearly, we were exonerated, completely, completely exonerated. Um, but it did set a very interesting tone for the whole of the medical profession, for the GMC, and for all other medical royal colleges, and now all colleges publish the data, which is remarkably similar. Um, but what it did do is it made us think very carefully about the needs of doctors coming to the UK from overseas. And it's not just about language. Language, you can test for language. It's about culture and that subtle nuance of language, which is much harder to teach and to learn. Um, you know, we know that English is a complicated language, but it's the subtleties, it's the regional variation. It's Spending the a penny. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Spending a penny. And I mean, I can think of having back on the Gynae, I've got 20 euphemisms for parts of the female body, you yeah. know. So, not so do that. most men. <laughs> this may even be some overlap. <laughs> so it's all that stuff. But also recognising that some people, we can tell when people go through um, training, when they go through the um, assessment criteria to become a doctor, uh, to become a GP, <coughs> we know that some people who are at the lower end of getting through in the first place are going to find it harder to qualify at the other end. So what we do now is we recognise that and try and give them more support earlier in their career. So try <coughs> to target people who might struggle later. It's you know it's a complicated world. It's always evolving. There's lots of research going on. There are more answers coming out. But it is not simple discrimination. Absolutely not that. Wouldn't help anybody. Why would we do that? Well, we need the doctors, don't we? What, what, what yeah. is, what's the college's position on, on Brexit? You've got a, a document coming out tomorrow, haven't you? We your, have some your rule the world document. Yay! So um, <coughs> mid midnight tonight, we will be releasing our manifesto: six steps to save the NHS. Six really? Steps. Yeah, absolutely. It's Only forty-eight six. hours. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Only six steps. No, but it's it's basically our way of laying down. Can you remember what the five. six steps are? Yeah, I was wishing I had my crib with me now, but the six are basically delivering the following. It's got to be money, 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 and people, doctors. People, yeah. <laughs> Well, that's the basis of it, but there yeah. are some key things. Delivering the promises of the GP forward fee that we've got. You know, in England, well, we've got this Okay, let's just... Uh, uh, that's yeah. just the first one. Well, come on, let's just talk about that for a minute, because yeah. the forward view is finished now, because the five-year forward view is supposed to finish in 2020, uh -huh. which is coterminous with the election, mm -hmm. the Treasury funding cycle, mm -hmm. and uh, Simon has um, you know, already had a battle with number 10 over the money and all the rest of it. Now... We, we, we're, we're going from where we are to another three years tagged on the end. So, uh, I mean, what, how, what do you think you'll do? Do you think we'll have the five son of five-year forward view or the five-year five forward view plus? Or? Five, five plus two forward view. Uh, so have you factored that in, 
in, in your document? Yeah, so in our document, we've stuck to the timeline. So you stuck to the timeline okay. of what? So after the five-year 4D, we had the GP 4D that was published just over a yeah. year ago. So we're yeah. one year into that one. And we are, we are calling for them to stick with the commitment to deliver by 2020 on GPs and money. So we're sticking with the original deadline because yeah. the plan is in place, we've got the deliverables. And let's face it, a huge amount of effort's gone into a really big plan. If you've got the same government, and the same thing is, we, we haven't fixed anything yet. We're only on the first few steps of fixing where we are. Yeah, but if we you, have to deliver well, if, I mean, if it, you believe let's, in the plan. Well, let's look at the two things. There's yeah. money and there's, there's staffing, which yeah. is workforce issues. If you look at the money, mm. the economy is growing at around 2%. Yeah. Uh, and that does not mean there's going to be a shed load more money. In fact, if anything, regardless of what you think about Brexit, whether you think we should come or stay or okie coke in and out or whatever, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's going to have an impact on the yeah, economy. It is. Uh, you know, however much of an enthusiast yeah. you might be for Brexit or whatever, it will have an impact. And it's already starting to have an impact. Yeah. So the economy, uh, in my opinion, is at best likely to stall. There will be bits of it that might do a bit better, but by and large, I think it's likely to stall. I think we've seen. Um, Craft today closed a factory up in Newcastle oh, and there's 800 jobs yeah. gone. They're moving it to Poland. I mean, okay, you say it's chocolate that they're making and chocolate's not important and maybe it isn't, but the jobs it's are. It's important to most of us. It's, yeah, it's, <laughs> but the jobs are important. So, I mean, the uh, my point is that with the best will in the world, I don't see there's going to be a huge amount more money. I mean, a lot of people are saying the election is a good opportunity to recalibrate the funding. I'm not so sure. Well, I think we've got to be realistic about funding in the medium to long term. You're right, we're not going to be awash with money. Whatever happens, it's going to be difficult. Um, and I, I don't think there's too many people out there who assume there is going to be a lot more money. I do think the country needs to have a serious conversation with itself about priorities and what we spend it on. You know, if, if we're spending significantly less of our GDP on health and social care than other countries are, then we need to ask well, we ourselves. Are. Yeah, si we're 6.3%. We the so European should, average is yeah. around 8. So we should be having a really serious conversation with the country. With the House of Lords have said that, haven't they? Yeah. And their sustainability report. Yeah. I mean, everybody's saying the same yeah. thing. We need to have a conversation. Yeah. Well, but, but how? Well, you've got an opportunity. If you have got a new government coming in for five years, they could be bold, they could be brave and make difficult decisions. Would you? Of course I would. Well, I wouldn't, because I, I would be focusing entirely every minute of the day on Brexit. No, you can't. We can't be distracted by Brexit. Well, I think because it's know. one important job. But, Roy, the world's going to go on. People are going to need health care throughout. And if we're fully distracted by Brexit, then the rest of things are going to suffer. And that would be so foolish for everybody. I, I think the government have taken a position now. Mm. <clears throat> I mean, you know, they cut the Home Office budget and crime went down, irritatingly. They cut the education <laughs> budget and the education attainment went up uh, oh, rather, rather, rather irritatingly and they cut our budget and we're in a real mess and I think the Treasury is saying look the NHS um, uh, improvement in performance swings between about 0.8% uh, to 1.2% is the best it's ever been mm. in, in terms of improvement and efficiency gains and all the rest of it. It's not enough. Simon's trying to get to 3.3 to 4% improvement by 2020. Oh really? How? Well, especially so much of it is, I think you said in one of your blogs, about it's your own salary. I you, never your realized own you read spend. I do read occasionally. I'm sneaky. I don't, don't admit to it very often. Uh, Everybody says that. <laughs> Sometimes they're really good. Yeah. Um, but it is that thing about, <laughs> you know, when you're spending on workforce, you haven't got much that you can work with. There isn't <coughs> very much that you can make efficiency savings on. And that's the hardest thing. You know, as a former treasurer, I understand what you can cut and what you can't cut. Yeah. And actually, if you need a workforce to do a job, you can't change that. That's a baseline. Well, it is interesting because our workforce is one of the most unchangeable workforces, isn't it? If you take, like, making cars, mm. I think I'm right in saying that uh, the, the workforce to make a car 20 years ago, it took eight people to make a car, and now it takes three or something. I mean, the figures aren't right, but the yeah, scale yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. That's because a lot of the work can be done by uh, artificial intelligence, yeah. robots, and all that kind of stuff. But we are so, it, it's such an intimate service that whilst there are elements of diagnosis, I suppose, that could be mechanized and do that sort of thing. Um, in fact, you know, it takes a nurse to do a nurse's job, it takes a doctor to do a doctor's yeah. job. So I don't see how, I mean, we can make doctors more efficient, we yeah. can use more 
innovative technologies yeah. to record stuff. Yeah. We can Better get data. Tus yeah. tests going through quicker. And there's a lot of stuff we can do. In fact, if I don't have in my you know to tomorrow, I'm writing about this tomorrow. There's a lot of stuff we can do, mm -hmm. but we don't make it easy for people to sell to the NHS, and that's a the real shame because we miss out. And the, and the other thing is that the the, the, the gains are, are really marginal. Because you know you've got seventy percent of your costs are in people. Mm -hmm. That's thirty percent left broadly. Mm -hmm. Do you want to try and save five percent of the budget? Mm -hmm. It's not five percent of the thirty percent mm -hmm. that's left. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you do it. Yeah, exactly. It's incredibly hard and it's unrealistic, and that's why we have to have the conversations at the bottom line. But, but what, who do got, we have the conversation with? Government. It's the, treasury level. It's, this isn't you know. This mm -hmm. isn't well, what are the treasury going to say? We're worried about Brexit. We're going to put away as much money as we can in case the economy goes down the pan and we need benefits and all the rest of it. We're not going to spend any more money on healthcare. Get over it. This is where the Royal Colleges, you know those Royal Colleges you think are a waste of space. This is where we can speak and have those difficult conversations and challenge. But also there's loads of other organisations. And do you know the biggest resource we've got? The entire population. Every person in this country who needs healthcare at some point, whose lives are touched by healthcare, has a voice and can have a voice. And we need to, you know, that popular support. We need well, people to be saying that's, speak that's to your call. That's called an election and we know the outcome. What, look, God help us. Okay, so that's your first, I don't think much of your first point, right? What's your second point? <laughs> well, we said about, so the delivering on the money, deliver yeah. on the people. So the promises to have a lot more allied health care professionals. Got more, we've got more GPs than we've ever had in the NHS. We're awash with GPs. We're not. We're Goodness desperately short you can't short of move for GPs. I thought you couldn't come and see <laughs> You're a bit short of the male ones in your practice. <laughs> You listen, I don't have to be cohesive. I don't know, I okay, fine. Apparently I do. <laughs> you, you so. do. <laughs> so, workforce. Um, actually, there are things about letting doctors come into the country. You know, we're talking about Brexit a lot. <coughs> we need to support our European and overseas uh, They're going home. Exactly, and we don't want them going home. We need to make them feel loved, nurtured. We want to enable them to it's stay. too late. We should be putting GPs on the shortage speciality list because we are so short of doctors. Well, I think and that's, well, a that's likely to go, isn't it? I mean, if... What, the if, shortage list? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I would have thought that whole migration thing... Mm -hmm. Uh, or immigration thing, well, oh. migration thing, will, will really have to be recalibrated. I mean, yeah. it's pretty sure, mm. uh, I just want to get your reaction to that, pretty sure that there will be some kind of a points or scoring system so some people in some know. occupations will, you know, the Australian scheme is not as great as they say it is, mm. but broadly speaking, there will be some priorities that we will want as a nation. So I don't know, want engineers or lollipop ladies or doctors and nurses and that. So there will be a way of prioritising mm -hmm. who comes in. So that will, I, it will carry on. Um, so whatever Mrs May is saying now about not letting people in and, and all the rest of it, 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 we're going to have to sort it out. I mean, we're going to go through a we, difficult two years. We're not, we don't have enough healthcare professionals in this country no. to take on these things. We, we are reliant on overseas. But, no, a whole one, moral question but no one else does. You see, that's the, that's the interesting thing. There is not a, a European country that has a surfeit of, of, of clinicians. There is in the Far East where they train more nurses than they need. In the with the intention of, ex, of yeah. their going overseas, but not in Europe. But actually, around the world, there are a lot of pe people where there are doctors who would like to come. To oh, that's a different thing. And actually, so that got, will get easier. Yeah, we've got to make, make it easy easier. for them. We need to absolutely yes. we do, and so we're calling for this. Let's put general practice on the shortage speciality list now for all, uh, for anywhere around the world. Obviously, when people come and in, we then have nurses? to recognise. Well, I practice nurses too. I think nurses are on the shortage list. Yeah, they are, but I, I don't know if they're specialist in that way. Okay, well, that's... But I we sort need of, to then train well, them. Well, I'd, yeah, I'd vote for your second point. Point. What's okay. your third point? So, third point, well, that was actually, that's three so far. But anyway, the next point, <laughs> whatever I was counting. <laughs> yes, yes, this is the treasure, <laughs> Rosie. Next treasure, I've gone count. Yes, all right, go on. Um, so, the next thing is, I'm just thinking frantically what they are in order. Well, um, you've got your press uh, you know, I've apparatchik got copy, here. I've got the copy of it behind me. No, 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 your apparatchik will tell you. <laughs> he's, he's just going, he's, de he's, no, uh, he's, he's just going to Google it and you'll find out. <laughs> it's not on the internet yet, it's not on the internet yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But no, so workforce, workload, get the um, EU doctor sort of extending GP training. Now, this one seems like a bit of an anathema at the moment. But general practice is really complicated. We are expert medical generalists. We are consultants in community medicine. Is that we have the largest curriculum of any speciality, by definition, because it's a bit of everything. And yet we expect these doctors to get through their training in three years. And then we throw them out after so many attempts if they don't get through it, and you know, cram condensed time. We know that if you give people a bit longer, 
they so come they're going to keep going until they pass? No. It's like no, a no. Boy Scout this badge. Is, no, no, this is just extending it by one year. This is extending the core training from three to four years with an extra, that whole extra year being based in general classes, consolidating what they're learning, doing extra training, particularly in things like mental health, um, extra work probably spent focusing on children's health, uh, gaining their confidence of that complexity and that richness of general practice. The academic case was made in 2008. In 2012, all the education bodies in the four nations agreed this was the right thing to do. And then something called the shape of training came in and kicked it into the long grass. And actually, we've got doctors coming out who are struggling because they are overwhelmed by the intensity of the workload they're facing because the world has gone a bit crazy. So but to protect our doctors and to protect patients for the future, to get the best doctors in society, we want to extend training. I'm not sure it does protect patients. You end up with doctors who have umpteen goes at passing. Well, no, well, no, 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 there's a cap on the number of times you can sit the exam. But what you do is you try and get people to sit the exams when they're ready for it, not because they've got an artificial time limit in which they've got to cram in the attempts. So there is a lot of sense in it. And I mean, we heard from government thrown back, oh, it'll cost more money. Of course it doesn't cost more money. You just have one year longer in a supervised environment when actually you're paid less than in a qualified environment. So the educator's budget will go up a little and the employer's budget will go down a little. A little. And actually so health education out. England will... So they would need a bit more money and it would have to come off the core NHS in That's, the That'll be popular. Right, what's the next one? It may not be popular, but it's important. Yeah. It's really important. What's the next one? What's the next one? I'm conscious we've muddled them all up a little okay. bit. Indemnity. In, GP indemnity, not an exciting, sexy topic <coughs> for other people, but actually... The insurance costs well, are I'll let you into a little secret. There's an expert on indemnity in the audience. I was aware there was somebody here yeah. from one of, one of the three large uh, defence organisations. Yes, other defence. We are working with the colleagues. Other, oh, we are other, working. Other, other defence organisations are, are available, available yeah. and, and a lucky rabbit's foot as well. <laughs> well, look, let's face it, it, it it's, it's the lawyers, isn't it? It's the no win, no fee lawyers that are busting the system. And uh, I, I mean, I'm torn because, on the one hand, that if someone has been damaged by the health service, they should be entitled yep. to go yep. to court and all the rest of it. And money should not preclude them from doing it. Yep. So the no win, no fee with the insurance basis is no bad thing. But on the other hand, it has turned itself into a rip-off. What about getting dumping the whole thing and, and doing the no fault thing like in, uh, is it New Zealand, isn't it? Yeah, some places that will have it. There, there are pros and cons of all these things. I mean, first of all, I would just look at the indemnity costs in England and Wales compared to Scotland. Doctors, so GPs in Scotland pay a third of what we do it, doctors in England pay yeah, because it's a different legal they've system. They've got a different legal system. But yeah. I mean, You're I not going to change that, that, are you? Well, th I'm sure there are lessons that we could learn from it. But the no Do you really think, <laughs> given the relationship <laughs> I aspire to Scott, great oh, change, Rob. Oh, yes, Mrs. May will love that. Yeah, that's a dot, this <laughs> Scottish legal put, system. We didn't put that in there. Eh? We didn't put that in the manifesto. Right. No, I'm not, not planning on rewriting the legal system. It's not my area of expertise. But actually, changing the system. So hospitals have a more of a crown indemnity-based system. So individual doctors don't bear the great brunt of their indemnity. It's a, it's a hospital-level indemnity. Well, the, the, the taxpayer does, doesn't it? Yes, it costs society. If the, the, the trust make a reserve up to whatever it is, and then the treasury pay out if they get really caught, and then the, the hospitals have to pay it back mm -hmm. through their external financing limits. So. The, and it's the same with the GPs, really, because we, you know, we pay the GPs contract, and, and it's they pay their indemnity. Is there a it's case a for? Why is there a stopping doing it? The problem yeah, is. Is there a case yeah. for for including GPs in the broader indemnity? Is that what you're saying? There, so there is a case for doing that. There are there are pros and cons. But the problem is the insurance at the end of your professional life. The hospitals will be expected to continue and continue to cover. But as a GP, if you go for insurance-based scheme. In the community, it's the runoff insurance. It's once you retire, it's what happens in the next 20 years. The patient you saw 20 years yeah, ago, it's, it's that kind of, and that's the difficulty. There's a lot of, I'm, I'm, I'm oversimplifying a horribly complex legal thing, but we're having conversations. Conversations are happening. What, which about, is good. what about when um, we're moving towards accountable care organizations yeah. now and trusts can acquire GP practices? Mm. So if you've got a, a salaried GP yeah. working for you, ostensibly in primary care but actually as part of the trust's global responsibilities who carries the indemnity <laughs> you tell me i mean that's the sort of stuff that needs to be worked out this is exactly Depends the same so the answer is no but we don't know we don't know if you're watching could, at home send us a text know. yeah it could be the employer or yeah. it might not so for example i no longer do out of hour shifts i used to do them i used to find them really 
rewarding, interesting part of my career. Variety, diversity, you know, seeing a whole different population. But actually, my indemnity costs for doing those sessions were so disproportionately expensive, I, w I worked out that I was working for nine to ten months a year just to pay the ink excess of my indemnity. Well, do you know what? Giving up your Saturday mornings, not having time with family, actually, that's quite a hard thing to do for basically free of charge. And so I stopped. And there are story that, that's repeated over and over and over. And there is talk about the system has some resilience. There are some people who could do more clinical sessions if only the indemnity didn't get in the way because there are barriers, there are steps. If you hit the next threshold, you're not covered. It used to be, years before, that my indemnity for my out-of-hours work was covered by the, by the um, out-of-hours provider. But then they changed, the system changed, that got taken away, suddenly not cost effective. Well, they tried to take it off the NHS balance sheet, didn't yeah. they, and move it into the private yeah. sector. So, yeah, which is, complex and Which has not, not gone well. Is there anything else in this miserable manifesto? It's a glorious to, manifesto. It's a manifesto of positivity <laughs> and hope, Roy. Hope. Hope for the future. Hope for patients. Give up. Abandon <laughs> hope all you into here. Come His on. side of what? the table, not my what side is, of the table. What? Is that it? So it's six steps. Six points. Resource the, the service properly. So it's the people, money, the people. The, the infrastructure, the yeah. training, yeah. the overseas doctor and the Brexit talk. Yeah. Uh, indemnity. I can't wait to review this. It's going to be fab. I'll give you a special copy tonight. Oh, Someone's going to print it before midnight. I should be reviewing this with a very interested eye. Really. <laughs> that you look at me like that. I'm sure it'll be wonderful, but uh, I, I mean, what, what are you like? Okay, let's, let's be sensible. What's yeah. going to happen? Yeah. Um, who are we dealing with? We're dealing with Norman Lamb yeah. uh, in the Lib Dems, who strikes me as a, a good hearted, sensible bloke. Very caring, and, committed. Yeah, yeah and uh, I think he would, well, he's already said he wants more money for health. Yeah, particularly mental health. Yeah, health they pinch my idea of moving <laughs> the money into the national insurance. Clearly a good idea. Health, national insurance, yeah, a brilliant idea. I Genius. Think. I came yeah. up with it two years ago and it's been roundly stolen. Uh, so I think, you know, they Some might, they might be. <laughs> They might be, they might be worth. Uh, they might be worth a vote. If uh, and then you've got Labour, John Ashworth, mm -hmm. who sat where you're sitting, mm -hmm. and uh, he's a really interesting guy. I think mm -hmm. we are. Anybody here for John Ashworth? Did you see? Mm -hmm. He was a good guy, wasn't he? We we all like John Ashworth. <laughs> we did. Uh, a very interesting family background. <laughs> right. Yeah, he won't mind me telling you this because we yeah. filmed him saying his dad was an alcoholic, right. and he had a really difficult childhood, yeah. and uh, he spoke very movingly. I think he about. Did health issues and so on yeah. and so I think he gets the health service mm -hmm. and he wants to do the health service mm -hmm. and he has trailed the idea again of moving the, the funding into something more identifiable mm -hmm. and, and out of the reach of the Treasury mm -hmm. and uh, and I think Corbyn is would be likely to say I will put more money in health uh, and then we've got Jeremy Hunt who has also sat there mm. and um, I mean I, I, I know he's a I mean, no, no in office Secretary of State is ever popular, let's face Indeed, it. Indeed, yeah. Um, but I thought, I thought he genuinely wanted to do the job. He had a yeah. row for, to get the job this time around. So we hear. Yeah, I, I, th I mean, I think it's true. I think it's what he, what he says is right. And, and I think he kind of gets it. But he lost his way really over the junior doctor's strike. But, that, but who wouldn't? It was such a mess. Yeah. And it was a mendacious strike, I think. I think it wasn't a strike about junior doctors. It was a political strike. Strike and when the HSJ revealed all the emails to, you know, to perpetuate the strike, I think that showed it up for what it was. But he's interested in safety and very and, much so, yeah. And yeah. he's made a Data. real made a real mess of seven day working. Uh, but that's not entirely his fault because I think uh, Uncle Bruce egged him on there a bit, Bruce Keogh. But I think uh, I think <coughs> my hunt tried to take it too far. So I mean, if you look at what we're dealing with. You say, who was your best chance of of your delivering your manifesto? Well, you know I can't be part of this, Roy, because we're in Perda, the Royal Colleges, we're part of the Charity Commission Mill, so I can't be part are of this. Are you really? Yeah, are yeah. the Royal Colleges yeah, in Perda? we are. Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah, very much so. So I really can't. What happens it. if you break it? I have no idea. There's a nasty <laughs> slap on the wrist. Should we find somebody out? Somebody to shout at me. Let's find out. <laughs> I don't think you'd bother with that. Let's find out. Do you reckon? I don't think you're in oh, Perda. We are. No, I think you might be involuntary Perda. Yeah, well, perhaps we're involuntary, but we're certainly. I don't think the rules apply. I think it's a parliamentary. I think we have to be very careful. Parliamentary careful. convention, actually. Well, we 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 as we as the academy and all the medical royal colleges, um, do are very careful about this. And certainly, I've written to all my council members saying, you know, remember anything you say with involved.
involving the council. We can't fit into these yeah. articles, so it's not helpful. Okay, well, However, let's, let, let me phrase the question another way. Then. There, that would let, be helpful. Let's say if you were bet 365, what, yes. what are the odds on your, <laughs> on your miserable manifesto being adopted by I'd you? I'd say there's a fantastic chance of being adopted because it's so sensible and pragmatic. Yeah. We're trying to make it easy for the parties. We're trying to make it easy for all the parties to see what matters. We've kept it very simple. We've kept it very high level. And we've got it out there early. Well, That's I the I'll tell you what is interesting. Mm. I mean, you've got your manifesto out ahead yeah. of the game. Well, well, actually, idea, I, I published my manifesto oh, yesterday. You? Yeah, but, but you got your manifesto out ahead of the game, yeah. well, and well done for that. Because I think that the main might took everybody by surprise, and no one's got anything other than ready. Do you want to see the cover of it? Right? I'm very pleased with the cover. Would right? you want to flash it in front yeah, of the camera? Yeah, I'll flash it in front of the camera. Get your stay in front of the camera. Your apparatchik Hand will get it. Handbag at the back there. Yes, go through, <laughs> go through the handbag. <laughs> apparatchik. <laughs> time to time to earn your. Earn your what do you, you see, I, mean, I just put my handbag at the back. Please don't knock the Institute of Healthcare Management banner down. <laughs> there it is. Is that it? That's it. Okay, let's have a look. I'll, I'll, <laughs> There's not much in it. There's not much to it, is there? I told really? you we keep it high level, clear I mean, cut, straightforward. It was, wasn't worth the trees, was it? It certainly right, was. Right, let's so deliver the forward view. Right, well, we've done we did that. that one. Okay, you can't yeah. deliver that. It's out of date anyway now. Yeah. So that's it's, a waste. We just refresh it. Increase the general practice workforce. You're at by at least 5,000. At least. Oh, really? Absolutely. Yeah. And, you want to in, and you want to lengthen training? Forget it. Safeguard the workforce we'll during Brexit. Well, uh, they're going to be a bargaining chip for the main line, so you can but forget that. But we have that. to say it. Grow the wider general practice team. I like that. It's important. That's, that's, that's the like most sensible thing you've numbers. said. <laughs> you didn't let me get a word in at the start. <laughs> it's because that's committed in the GP4 view. It's in yeah. there. They are actually a very underused resource, aren't yeah, they? They're fantastic. I like the idea of them prescribing as well. Nurse prescribers or others prescribing. Other prescribers, radiologists prescribing, yeah. uh, uh, OTs. I mean, anybody that hands on anybody patients. Anybody who's properly trained yeah. and it's appropriate to do so. With the college, yeah. you support that. Yes, we do, absolutely. Yeah. We're trying to work, you know, widening that allied healthcare professional yeah. team. De uh, develop a sustainable long-term solution to bringing down the rising cost of medical indemnity. indemnity well, indemnity. if you doctors stop buggering things up, it will be a lot cheaper, <laughs> so they won't do that. And increase the length of GP training, you're having a laugh. You see, I could, rem hey? I could remember them. <laughs> so so you did. We're, we're not publishing it till midnight. You did well. I would, sorry, uh, but if you've, if you've just been, uh, if, if you have you just have just been watching this at home you can't read this because it's embargoed do your screenshot now okay and uh, do your screenshot now yes uh, but it is embargoed <laughs> no, no thank you well done well done for getting it out anyway thank so, you. so until, let's talk about the royal college because i mean sure. there's no way really you could be the uh, you know one day a week doctor you know, pretend to be a GP and be the I'm top GP. I'm still a partner, Roy. So I'm lot. making decisions about my practice all the time. Lot. There, I mean, I there must be on. a lot of doctors who are much better qualified to take this job on. Do you reckon? Yes. Then why does nobody Look at your... Well, that's interesting, because it was a very low turnout, wasn't it? No, Roy, it wasn't. It was almost 100% turnout for the chair of the college. Yeah, it's Because very, only the council votes. I seem to read that it was... Oh, it's only the council right. vote. Yeah, who is... Where, which is the membership vote? That, the membership is the president. That's right. And low turnout. Members. Yeah. There was last time. In fact, before coming here today, I did a bit of a promotional video for our members to try and encourage people to vote yes. uh, in the next relevant election. Yeah. So, you, it is important so you were a shoe in for the, uh, the fit up? The no, right. I was still a full candidate standing. It was a good fair fight, a good yeah. clean fair fight. A good fight. clean fair fight. I mean, actually, I'm pleased to see you elected, to be honest with you, because we could do without another grey haired old geezer doing the job, I must say. That, uh, well, Maureen was good, wasn't she? Maureen was great. I was yeah. declared before her. So yeah. In fact, there's been, there were comments that, you know, three women in a row, but yes. nobody commented there'd been 14 chaps in a row prior to that. So. Yeah, we won't go there because I've already got into trouble about that grumpy old geezer. I can't find a GP <laughs> that's a grumpy old geezer. It's getting harder to find a GP all the time. Yeah, Roy. I'm going to gonna set up the Society for Grumpy Old Geezers. Yeah. But what is the? I mean, what is what is the future? I mean, you're standing yeah. on the sidelines. You, I, you, when you first came in, you were going to fight for this and do that. It sounded like student politics for me. Uh, I mean, where where's the where's the influence really gone? Do you mean for colleges generally? Yeah, and me? Uh, I think so. So the there was a time when you know politicians would listen. They don't now, do they? I think they do. Roy. I really? think health is a really big issue because it affects everybody, and the public and the voters care about health. So actually help is important and mobilising that, getting the patient voice out there is important. We recognise that. We've got, you know, our campaign that put patient first back general practice was in association with the National Association of Patient Participation Group. So we've got patient participation in the college and the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. 
uh, as the Royal College of GPs, you know, scientific knowledge applied with compassion. That's our motto of Conscientia Caritas. And I think that's a phenomenal motto. It's something about it's keeping the patient at the heart of what we do. It's reminding why we became doctors or healthcare professionals. Have you got any patients things. on your council? Uh, on our council, yes, we have. Yeah, 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 yeah we do. Yeah. How do you get to do that then? Uh, well, we advertise nationally for members of our patient participation group because we've yeah. got a big committee. We've got regional reps. That. Do yeah. Rabina Shah is the chair of our patient participation group at the moment. But we've got yeah. we've got ones in each devolved nation, um, and we've got yeah. We've, in fact, we've just appointed six new people and looking forward to yeah. meeting them before too long. So. so what what do you want to achieve then? Now you're in the chair. How long are you in the chair for? Three years. Three years. Uh, do you, do you, I mean, I suppose really you've been slightly sideswiped by the election. Yeah, invigorated, I like to think of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, okay, it was a I bit of a side it very last invigorating, week. <laughs> yeah. Another election. So, no, yeah, I didn't expect to have an, a general election during my term of office. Um, I thought I was all about delivery on GP Forward View, um, recruiting, retaining, returning people, getting more people into the profession, looking at the interface, new ways of working. I mean, I think we have to evolve to survive in general practice. We've got well, to be that's, realistic. That's another area I, you know, I'd like to really uh, explore with you, and that is the role of, of the technology stuff. Okay. Yeah. Because, I mean, I'm torn really. Because uh, if I was a doctor, mm -hmm. I probably would have been trained to use my uh, observational uh, observation and sight and sound, and, and, and it, it's more than you know when you sit someone in front of you. You know, it's a kind of personal, intimate thing. If someone comes in and says, you know, I've got you know maggots in my scrotum. <laughs> Very personal. Right? Yeah. Uh, um, uh, or uh, you know, a lot of doctors talk about the door handle, don't they? When they, when the, oh, oh, oh and by the way, doctor, thing, doctor, yeah, just, oh, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I get the intimacy of that, yeah. and I do understand the risks that there are to careers if you get things wrong yeah. and the rest of it. But you know, if you look at say diabetes, for example, mm -hmm. we've got 3.5 million people with diabetes yeah. in this country. It's going to be five million by 2000 yeah. and soon, whatever it is. 25 or whatever. Yeah, and, and there's no way you're going to be able to do that. You know, we have got to start thinking about use the use of technology. Yeah. And so, if you start with the basics, you know, quite a lot of the stuff that that, that you can do with a doctor, you could do with FaceTime. Uh, but I understand mm -hmm. the reluctance of doctors who want to do that for FaceTime. But let's face it, we've got Babylon, which is the new app that uh, we've got. GoDoc, I mm -hmm. think. Quite a few of them. Uh, there's a lot of them, and they are popular. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are. You know, they, for, if you've got a young family mm -hmm. and you know you want a bit of reassurance or whatever, you know, hurrah about getting the, getting a, an appointment. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I think that unless GPs understand what is happening here, they're going to be like the gas lamp. You know, they're going to be overtaken by apps and a doc I can get hold of now. Okay. So there's quite a lot of stuff in here. Let's disentangle it a bit. So we've got technology. Using more technology, fantastic. In fact, in general, GPs have been early adopters of technology. The first people have computers in the NHS, the first to prescribe, the first to have mobile phones, because actually a gadget that makes life easier makes sense and people will do it. And as small independent businesses, actually you have got the opportunity to innovate. If you've got the headspace and you can see a need, use it. So I think <coughs> technology and GPs, generally great. They love it. However, so, so there's, there's that bit of it, and I think it doesn't take a lot for GPs to embrace new tech. I mean, you know, I love the fact that in my practice we, we handle virtually no paper at all. You know, the nonsense that stuff arrives in on paper, then we scan it so I don't have to handle the paper because the only way to communicate with my the three different hospitals that we work with all are on different systems and none of them talk to each other. You know, anyway, we can improve, we really can improve, and with a fairly modest investment in IT infrastructure, we could do so much better in the NHS. So, but what you're talking about remote consulting, there's some great stuff with remote consulting and there's some risky stuff with remote consulting. Great stuff, you know, remote and rural areas providing urgent access to services and when you're under doctors and people need something, you know, does this rash look serious doctor? You know, you can do some of that stuff. It's, it's simple, single condition stuff and ideally if people have got access to the digital electronic record. But the human condition is generally much more complicated yeah, well, no, but hang on, because we're just going to kind of throw this all away. The, no, no, no. There's no silver bullet for this, I get, yeah, yeah. but there is silver buckshot. So, you know, there'll be... That's a metaphor. There'll be, there'll be I mean, w when my mum was alive, mm. she was devoted to her GP. Good. And, you know, that was that. Me, I don't give a stuff. 
Uh, I mean, I get up and go to work in the morning and my GP surgery is closed. I come home in the evening, the GP surgery is closed. Saturdays is there for an emergency, whatever that is. And then Sunday, I go to church, sprinkle myself with holy water, pray for a cure, you know, because they're closed. So I never see primary care open. It's a complete waste of money as far as I'm concerned. I've never seen the lights on. I told you the last time I saw my GP was in a restaurant in Albuquerque. Interesting you recognised me. Uh, yeah, I did, yeah. Uh, and, you know, the whole thing was, uh, you know, the whole thing is, for me, primary care is a complete waste of money. What I want is primary care on Waterloo Station, open at 7 o'clock in the morning. But, Roy, if you want to pay to use Babylon or one of these other apps, go for it. It may suit your needs completely well, because if genuinely you suddenly wake up one morning with a rash and you think, ooh, what is that? I want that checked. You can do that, and that's fine. But would you be, are you content to see that? Because that, it, when we get to the point where we're no longer prepared to syndicate, that our risks of injury and accident and illness and disease and all the rest of it, because I say, oh, bug it, you know, I, I, I'm going to buy Babylon. And then I'm going to start saying, well, why am I paying all these bloody taxes for the NHS? I never use it. Well, do you, so do you seriously so want back, that fracture? Okay. Let's come back to NHS versus fracture. Because, you know, again, we've conflated No, it's things. not that, is well, it? Well, it is. Well, no. Let's do it's the, technology let's do versus not technology. No, because we want this stuff. So, you know, so there are practices already that offer Skype consultations with patients. Out of hours care that uses Skype as, as, a, as a tool is lovely. Just one of the examples. But it's so, rare. It's rare, but it's, but it's expanding. You've got to start somewhere. These big tech companies are going down the private model because that's the only way of financing it. The NHS could choose to buy these services if they are good. They have. And in, once do you know they have in Jersey? I've heard there are pilots going. No, on. no, so in Jersey, yeah, okay. they've given everybody Babylon. They've great. given that. Fine. Big, and it will be a great big experiment, and I sincerely hope somebody with a careful, critical eye is watching to make sure what the health outcomes yeah, are. But that's it, the problem. But it won't. Be, look, it won't be as good. We know that, right? right? It won't be as good. Yeah. But but. But it might help uh, shore Jim, up the service. When Jim Mackey, yeah, when Jim Mackey uh, came, you know, the Jim yeah, Reaper, as we call him, yeah. he, when he sat it. where you're sitting, yeah. I mean, he, he talked about, you know, good enough is good enough. Mm. Um, and and he, good enough care for your family. Well, well, no, well he, he, he said it with regret. Mm. I mean, we're not saying good enough is good enough. Mm. We're saying that good enough is going to have to be good enough. Mm. Because I don't see, I mean, apart from this wonderful six set for general practice, I'm going to show you again, screenshot too late. Um, <laughs> I, you know, as, but apart from, I mean, look, I, I can't see with it, and I'm not being disrespectful, I can't see that being achieved. Um, uh, I mean, some of it will be achieved, but well, I don't, it, yeah. yeah, bits of it will be, but I don't think it will be. And I can't see us resolving mm -hmm. the, G, the, the, the crisis that there is in, in general practice anytime soon without mm -hmm. lifting some of the stuff off of the backs of the GPs, for example. Um, uh, well, we talked about diabetes, didn't we? Uh -huh. I mean, you, you could use technology uh, to, to maintain, but hey, just let me yeah, finish by. Uh, you, you, you could use technology uh, to maintain an otherwise well diabetics. Yep. Um, but if, if I'm going to send my data in every day to you, mm -hmm. and somebody's got to sit there and review it every day, that doesn't help. If we were to invest in regional call centers, where the algorithm is built over a much bigger area, maybe 300,000 patients mm -hmm. or more, half a million maybe. <coughs> we could do COPD, we could do that, because the baby boomers are coming through. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people like me, net savvy, understand how it That's works, you. not going to be bugging about trying 80 to... 80-year-olds are net savvy. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we've, we all there's a different group of people coming through. And one wonders really if the investment uh, shouldn't be... I mean, it would have to be private investment, I suppose, to invest in the call centres. So you you said, so you so you said, if I, if I so you say, well, you're diabetic. Sorry, you're diabetic, but it's your diabetes. You've got to look after it. We're not going to do it. Yeah. Here's a prescription. You go home and you do it on your computer. You log in with the call centre, send your stuff in, and then they monitor you. And if you if something happens, they ring you up. And it takes them, it takes me out of your waiting room. The biggest problem with that is that people rarely, you know, the vast majority of people who haven't got diabetes have got something else too. Mm. And if you break it into silos, so you just have a diabetes service like that, it might be a fantastic diabetes service, but what about the high blood pressure? What about the depression? What about the chronic pain problems? What about their social housing and all the other but stuff? But what about the, the ones that don't? Is, well, the, well, for some that don't, it might be great, but actually, you don't even need many people in the call centre. Most of it can be done with an app. If you're prepared 
do your finger pick readings and send them in, then actually oh, an app can yes. really help with that. Yes. And then have it uploaded to your central NHS record. You don't need to set up a whole new infrastructure for that. I mean, I like the idea of using technology better. I like the idea of using pathways and algorithms for where we can. The problem is the majority of people with chronic health conditions have several of them, and they go up with age, and you've seen all the graphs, I don't need to tell you mm. this, you know, multimorbidity, polypharmacy, all goes up with age. Throw in deprivation into the question as well, and you're adding another well, competitive. Then, I mean, if, if so, you're saying that that, that is the, the condition of the market, if yeah. we look at it as a yeah. business proposition, if that's what the market is, then we're never going to resolve it, because no, we, we, won't have, we won't resolve it um, mm. with, with 5,000 more GPs. Okay, 5,000 GPs is one step. It's only one small part of it. I agree, 5,000, that's not enough. That probably should be 10 if you wanted to stick with the traditional model. But we're talking about evolving the whole model. General practice is evolving Doesn't all the time. doesn't say that in here. I, I try to keep it simple, though. You know, what's pragmatic for the government? We don't want to confuse people. No, but the reality is... with politicians. <laughs> the reality is the general practice, like all other parts of the NHS, has to evolve. We've look, got to look at new ways of working, innovation in the way we practice. We're talking about working at scale scaling up, working together in more professional ways. Do you think the federations will resolve that? No, federations were one way of bringing people together. But the problem is, what is a federation? I've seen at least 15 different models of what a federation is. Well, well, does it matter? It's just a way that people can work together. Working together you can helps. cut your back Call office, you like. back office yeah, class, you can get your appointments you sorted out, you can have contract. one specialism in one GP yeah. practice and not in <laughs> yeah. another. I mean, it so does seem case, to me... Yeah, that's working at scale, which, yes, is an important part of moving yeah. forward. But it's not going to fit anybody remotely. the NAPC home, uh, primary, primary care, care home. is it is one really good model, which talks about working at thirty to 50,000 patients, and that has got traction all over the place. There are other, mo there are other pillars yes. of the primary care home, which well, are James well. Kingsland sat in that seat and yeah. told us all about it one night. Right. It's, uh, good. And it's interesting. Yeah. And it works in some places, and there are 15 practices that are doing it, and of those 15... Five are really flying with it, mm. five are getting there, and five are struggling with it. You know, it is one model that's under investigation. Is that a exciting. problem that there's too many models? Well, this is the thing about local need. I mean, if you don't well, Simon, have no, it comes system. to the five year forward view, because yeah. Simon said, Look, I'm not here to impose anything. Absolutely. Go and sort yourselves yeah. out. Uh, I, don't want a, I don't want a thousand flowers, flowers to bloom, which he is said. A in what you it, yeah, but he said, I didn't want that. Uh, uh, and he had the Vanguard model. Yeah. Which, as far as I can see, I mean, Sam Jones came and talked to us one night. I mean, the, the Vanguards have been a success, as far as I can see. They've been a success, but they've been really expensive. So the mm. Vanguards have reached about 9% of the population, cost a lot of money, done some brilliant stuff. I mean, really exciting, buzzy stuff. And, you know, shining a light. When you think you haven't got hope, look at what some of the Vanguards have done. But they've done it with a shed load of money, yeah, which but, has bought headspace for people to do creative things. Yeah, but, but the followers, Vanguard 2, mm. uh, the four triumphs, the triumphs, not the Vanguards, um, they... They'll do it easier, won't they? They won't need well, as they much have money. They won't need as much money, but they will still need money and headspace. And that's what's difficult, is when you when you try and roll things out and say, right, everyone can do it without any money and without any headspace. That's where it falls down. So, mm -hmm. you know, you've got, I, I talk about the workforce and, and the NHS as being a spectrum where you've got the top 10% are the passionate enthusiasts who will go for it, either through necessity or through genuine passion and fire, will push forward. And they're the ones who grab the Vanguard model and run with it. You've got the 10% or so down the bottom end who've got the, the ostriches with their heads in the sand who are never going to, they're not going to change until they absolutely have to, until they fall over. But the massive majority in the middle are scared, they're struggling, they're finding it hard to recruit, they don't know what the future holds and they need hope right now. They need hope and they need guidance and they need, they need inspiration, they need models that they can say, actually, that would work, I could do that and I need a bit of help to get there. But they do need resource to do it, and they need people to do it, and they need headspace. That's a very interesting thing to say. We're coming up to the end of our time. Has, has any, have we got any questions on Periscope, uh, John? Um, there was a question about the role of GPs in hospitals uh, okay. with the move to... Uh, Vertical integration? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just, uh, uh, are, we talking, are we talking about putting GPs in A&E? &E? Yes. Yeah, there's exactly. 35 million quid announced today, mm. which, is, which is capital, not revenue. What, what, what are we supposed to do with 35 million quid in A&E? Do you build another Kazi or buy a desk for a GP? What's, I don't get that. Do you know? No, I don't. No, I don't. I haven't got been tested with us at all. Uh, I mean, GPs in A&E is a good idea. It's an interesting idea, and if we have the workforce, there's some places that make it work well. Um, when I was a junior doctor, uh, we used to, when I was working in A&E, we used to go off for our training afternoon and they'd bring some local GPs in, and the consultants always said the department ran beautifully when the local GPs ran it. 
But at the end of the day, the GPs were consultants in generalism. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were better at handling risk than us as junior doctors were. So if you put GPs into a &E, if you ask every A&E department, would you like another consultant? Of course they'd say yes. What they're asking for is a consultant who happens to be a GP. Um, and it'll help but it's going to deplete the community workforce. And so what are you going to do? If you haven't got enough clinicians, then you need to balance it out. There are places where GPs and A&E is a great idea. Actually, I'm more concerned about getting the GPs in the communities with the patients that they're serving to save them, get to save patients going to the wrong place. You know, we're only suggesting you put them there because some patients wander into A&E because they say they can't well, get funded in the community. That's really interesting you should say that because I was in, uh, a couple of months ago, I was in the best hospital in the world which is Frimley Park. Oh, indeed. F fabulous Frimley Park. Uh, and I was in there visiting uh, someone and I had to go through A&E. Now, it was three o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. It was standing room only. And I would think the age, average age was from about 16 in football kit yeah, later through to about mid-50s. Sprained knees and ankles from Sunday yeah, school. Mid fifties, yeah. you know, yeah, and I and I thought, you know what? I'd like to ask everybody here, mm -hmm. why are you here? But actually, the Sunday afternoon phenomena, we know there's loads of people play sport at the weekend, and so you get the kids with injuries brought in because they've done it on Saturday or they've woken up on Sunday and they've been pain, and we're going to have Sunday lunch if you're still hurt, and I'll take you on Sunday afternoon. There is a peak in that age group going in there, um, but actually. They're not, you don't need a GP surgery for those either. What you need are advanced nurse practitioners in a and E's with a fast throughput and a good triage system. Do they need x-ray? Do they not? Do they need strapping? Do they need crutches? Out. They're actually relatively quick throughput. What, what, what we struggle with is the patients who shouldn't be in a and E because they've got complex medical problems that should be better served by a better setup in the Does community. that mean a better out of hours service? Yeah, a better supported out of hours. So the out of hours GP service, out of hours 111, the whole service resources more clinicians but not just doctors i'm talking about paramedics nurses as well. do very well paramedics yeah. are great yeah. in emergency situations i mean there are some good pilots well, there's of paramedics a paramedic in working visit. gp practices there yeah. are and that's very exciting we're watching that one with interest you know you know i'm keen on allied healthcare professionals working as part of that primary care team it is a team um, and there would be different things so, you know when i think about the visit request that came to my surgery yesterday you know there's an alcoholic lying on the floor he doesn't need a gp he needs there's an old lady with it's a bad cushion. chest. Well, of course, a cushion, indeed, yeah. and possibly a bucket. But you know, the old lady with a bad chest. It could be a GP. A nurse practitioner could probably do that just as well. Probably doesn't need a paramedic. She didn't sound uh, 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 vision was an issue. You know, paramedics are great with it. Do they need to scoop and run, or do they can they fix this at home? So you know, it's different people for different things. And I think it's keeping that perspective and recognizing it's not simple. It's never going to be simple. Things so, like this, we make them simple to make them have impact. But the, it is complicated. Of course, it's complicated. If it was easy, everyone would be doing. Everyone would be doing right. it. Has anybody got anything they'd like to say? Any questions they'd like to ask? Um, or I'm open to suggestions. Yes, Angus. Um, just uh, where you are on social prescribing. Yeah, social prescribing. Complete waste of money, isn't it? Well, social prescribing is interesting, <laughs> and it has a lot of intuitive appeal. Well, who did that risk? There was a report, was it? Who just who yeah. said? Yeah. I read but somebody said it's a waste of a money. There is, there is a, uh, there is we a had serious Sam Ethingham, I must have told you, Sam Ethingham sat there and engaged us all one night yeah. with social prescribing. And if you ever go to Sam Ethingham's practice, yeah, yeah. you know, it's a garden centre with a coffee shop, and somewhere in it, there's a GP surgery. Patients love it. I know, I, Doctors do, like I think it's great. Well. Yeah. So, no, social prescribing is it's not evidence backing, but there isn't much hard evidence, certainly not in terms of patient outcomes yet. So, we're looking for that. I'm very interested in looking for it. There's a lot of intuitive appeal, and it's a great way of engaging people with the practice. So I've got a big mission and agenda to get charities working together with healthcare better, so get that third sector in, and this is a huge role they can play. Engage your patient participation in activating. There is feel-good stuff that make people feel better that perhaps isn't easy to count in terms of hard outcomes, but there is something there that feels right, and I'm sure there is right, we just haven't got the evidence yet. Are you a bit too academic, really, about all this? You've got a strong academic background. I mean, does it really matter if there's not hard evaluation? There's fuzzy stuff, isn't there? There's fuzzy stuff. I, know, I challenge the academic community yeah. in terms of you need gold standard evidence for something. Do you want to bring a new drug in? You really need to know if it's working, mm. if it's safe. There is stuff where I've challenged the academic community about silver standard evidence that actually it doesn't <coughs> have to be, you know, however many degrees of freedom and whatever confidence limits. It needs to be good enough. So, for example, a new model of working, a new way of trying to do something, social prescribing, it's not going to do any harm, 
therefore, what is the cost of doing it versus the cost of not doing it? Is it worth trying? And let's pilot it a bit longer. So you can be a bit more soft and fuzzy. But the, again, it's, it's full of stuff that really doesn't work. Well, you would see, if I take you back to what you were saying about, uh, I'll come to you in a second, mm. uh, what you were saying about uh, di uh, diabetics, you know, mm. you could end up with depression and, and oh, yeah. I mean, a lot of that would be about, you know, buy a dog or, you know, get out more. Do you know, buying a dog works for a lot of people, increase yeah. your exercise a lot, you will love yeah, a bit of joy yeah, in your I mean, life. That's a bit frivolous, you know, but I mean the point I'm making is that, that the answer to that is probably in social prescribing as much as it is in an antidepressant. Is, this is what I meant about yeah. the intuitive appeal, it feels like it should work and it should help, so I want it to work, we've just not seen a lot yet. So, sorry, hi there. Um, how long do you think the time left is learned or maybe not learned from the execution of something which time is just a waste of life? Wow. It's going to be a really interesting time, and it's not for me to say because I won't be doing it. I'll just be there watching closely and reporting back on it. Um, there are a lot of lessons to be learned in the STPT process, not least the unholy haste with which things got rushed through. The fact that they forgot about primary care in some areas, and in other areas they work on the basis that you don't need primary care, which is a little bit tricky. And most chief hospital chief, chief execs, if you say to them, oh, by the way, we're going to shut down primary care in your area, do the math, and we reckon 48 hours in most hospitals would be on their knees because. We've set up a system which is weighted that way. So if you don't factor in primary care to your planning, so much for sustainability. It won't be sustainable if you don't transform primary care as well as secondary. So we're very clear about that. Get primary care on the journey with you as well as social health because it's just as important. It's, I, I talk about a three-legged stool, a tripod. I, I talked about a Welsh milking stool, but I was told that was old-fashioned. So I talk about a tripod now, which is apparently more socially acceptable. But actually, we're all integrated. Uh, you know, we're all interlinked, and so to do one without the other is naive. What it's happened with STP? I mean, uh, I mean, I thought that it was uh, a wonderful example, really, of, of I mean, Simon said, well, it's pretty clear that yeah. we need a, a strategic overview of what's going to yeah. happen in the future it's to good replace concept. strategic enterprises. Go away, sort yourselves Make out, and so. work together, and then you end up with this bum fight of people who won't work together. So many places, so not all, not yeah. all of them, but so many of them. Is, oh, is, is yeah. it human nature? Uh, uh, but they, they, what's interesting is it started like that. I mean, we've been watching, obviously, very interested in some areas, totally dysfunctioning. In other areas, actually, they took really good stuff. Yes, people did. did talk. And I think, you know, I'm the glass half full person here, and actually, I would like us to be looking at those who've done a really good job and try and shine a light and say, let's spread this, let's share the good stuff. Um, you know, now the spotlight is off the actual plans and it's all about just doing something that works locally. And let's get people in. You know, we put ambassadors, wow. GP ambassadors into all areas of the country to try and have the conversations and bring people together. And it's working. You know, just amongst general practice, we've got various factions and families. They're talking for the first time. I talk to GP surgeries about, you know, a new breed of general practice, a new collaborative mode of working with our colleagues and, and our neighbours in a way we didn't before. You know, it, it, historically, when I say to a room of GPs, do you remember the time when you didn't talk to the practice next door because 30 years ago the senior partner passed in his parking space, so we didn't talk? Those days need to move on. We need to professionalise and get over it. Well, where I live, my local CCG mm. is 97,000 people. You know, I, there are bigger bridge clubs. Well, there are certainly bigger GP surgeries than that. Yeah, it's just, it's just hopeless. Right, yeah, oh, yeah, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, we'll, we'll do the indemnity guy last, because I think he's going <laughs> to send us home in tears. Oh, no, finish on joy, please. <laughs> yes, I know, on joy. yes, sir, yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Peter Gill, I'm a GP in Kent. It's, it's more of a comment, really, which is that, Helen, I don't think you gave Roy a hard enough time when you were talking about the technology bit, about the human component of yeah. general practice, the Let's requirement for the doctor or the AMD or whoever it is to actually eyeball the patient. Well, I think I, I said your that. Diabetes it's yeah. the essence of the patient. Say, yeah. why it matters to actually well, I think I said that. I said I'm in two minds about it, didn't I? If you cast your mind, I'm in two minds. I see it from the GP's point of view, sitting opposite. So I said all that. But what I also said was, we uh, are we getting to the point where, as delightful as that is, uh, we may have to sacrifice some of it. For example, I mean, uh, there was a time when you could register with a GP and you'd always see the same person. Now you register with a practice and you can see anybody. Uh, we, we've given that up. It's gone because we can't do it. And do we get to the point now where this is going to go because we can't do it? Okay. Sure. But the influence, the human influence, is still enormous. No one's mean, denying you know, the, that. The most cost effective intervention. No one is denying that. Is the, the doctor, doctor saying, 
you know, telling the person to stop. Pull yourself course. together, yeah. So it's I, I mean, I, we get that, but the point is, uh, the point I, I, that I think we were discussing was, was we can't do that anymore. Well, actually, I think we can. There are some fantastic pockets where they're managing to do it. They're triaging and streaming patients. So those who have got the acute, more straightforward stuff are being seen by other people. And the more complicated people are getting that continuity of care. They're being put into teams. So even in massive practices, you're in, let's say you're in the, he the Dr. Helen team. So in Dr. Helen's team, there's Dr. Helen and Dr. Dr. Roy and the Dr. Helen's team and you know that if you're in that team and you phone up and it's a complicated problem that needs you don't mind waiting to see one of them you can see either Dr. Helen or Dr. Roy they've got your record they've got shared understanding of you your family mm. your social context and your psychological thing, and it can be done and we know that if we add to Dr. Helen and Dr. Roy we add Nurse Jane and the practice pharmacist and all the rest of it we can be a cluster of teams well, I, get, a I do get that but so, I, and but that I, helps and patients trust yeah. They trust us better, we use less resource, and we, we get to the heart of the problem I, faster. So if we can I, do it, it is I where we should that. aim to be. And, but what I'm saying is, instead of saying, we're going to do this, we're in the territory of where we can do it, we will. It's slipping away. And I'm not saying I'm pleased about it slipping away, which is why I mentioned what uh, the Jim Reaper told us about, you know, good enough is good enough. Mm. And we don't, none of us want that. And, and, and again, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, we've, your leg about this, and it's but it's a, you know, I mean, and who's going to argue with any of that? But you know, 5,000 more GPs ain't going to crack this, you know, not not when the number of diabetics goes from 3.5 million to 5 that's, million. That's a standstill, you know, uh, that by 2021. We, we're not getting anywhere near solving this, uh, and in doing the same things ain't going to crack it, in my view. There was a question here. Oh, God, it's the indemnity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to throw myself off the bar Be stool. Nice. <laughs> it's not the indemnity question at all. It's, oh, uh, really? it's, Helen, you're very supportive of AHP, but yeah. I'm quite interested. We're, we're training a lot of physician assistants, mm. or associates, or whatever we call them yeah. at the moment. Yeah. Um, but the vast majority of them are going to work in secondary care. And I think the last... Um, uh, GP survey of practice staff, there's about eight in the country. I just wondered why they're not attracted to uh, primary care, okay. either so we're, career we're, wise just or protectionism, okay. isn't it? Good old faction protection. There's a, there's a few things in there. So there's a load of schemes going up to train far more of them. We're looking for about a thousand of them in primary care over the next couple of years in that time frame. Um, and one, one of the problems has actually been getting training placements for them because there's no funding associated with it. It's a small business model, general practice, actually. You know, it's quite hard to take the time out to train somebody if you haven't got any money to do it. However, people are starting to recognise that it's worth the investment because if they come and train with you, they're likely to come back and work with you. So there are places, and they are taking off. We've got a few examples in the Midlands, um, South London, places doing it. So it's coming. Um, what more of the issues are about standards, the assessment, and actually regulation. It's an unregulated profession currently, and as yet, they're not able to prescribe. Once those things are ironed out, I think you'll find a complete mushrooming of this as a as, as, a, as a new class of healthcare practitioners. But what about the argument that says if we're going to waste money uh, training half cock doctors, we might as well use the money to train proper doctors? Well, you know, to, tra to train somebody from a medical student through to being a qualified GP is at least a decade, actually. These Does it have to take that long? Yes. Really? And I'd argue it takes, should take longer, actually, right? Actually, to do the job properly, yes. I mean, you're not going to argue it's a short... I mean, every developed country in the world has undergraduate and postgraduate training that at least that length. Actually, that is the reality. So I don't think we can change that paradigm. But I think the idea of training people to do the job they need to do, and this is the thing about using people and training them in a more appropriate time frame, might be appropriate for specific jobs. We've got to be realistic and honest about what they can and can't do. You know, that complexity, that richness. So, again, another what model What about charging about. a tenner to see a GP? No. Free at the point of need. Make it 50 quid. No. No? No. Not going there. No, I, I agree. <laughs> Listen, we're, we've run over our time and you know I'm just uh, I'm, I've had a great evening I don't know where the time look just look up the clock I thought bloody where's the